So one of the things we have to think about when we look at obesity, we see in our society overweight, measuring our waistline, we find people sitting down and we have an issue here, obviously with this patient, there's a problem with the energy balance and expenditure that we see in this patient, these individuals. Then we see there's children being affected, it's not long, not just adults, it's estimated now that basically 20% of the uh, adolescent population is overweight to obese, while adults represent one-third of the population in the United States. Is it only a problem in this country? It is not. As you'll see, it's a problem of global proportion that's going to be affecting us for the 21st century and beyond, and we need to have an understanding to deal with it in order to really make sure that we have a healthy and long-lived society. And then there are families. There's a genetic component that people don't realize that run in a, a number of families that uh, weight is an issue. We're going to look at the mechanisms that are responsible for this to occur. And then we have the, ext the extreme factor in terms of extreme obesity that one sees. And we look at these individuals and how their life has changed and the stigma that carries along with obesity and how it's going to impact the rest of their lives, how society treats them, whether it's socially or professionally or employment. And all these factors have a major impact on our society. And it's important to understand the, uh, what the underlying factors are involved to really get a hold of how to deal with being overweight. It's not just people. Or even our own pets, 60% of the pets in the United States are cats and dogs are also overweight. The food we give them is the same food we get. A lot of people give the, the food from their diet onto their plate and you can see the poor dog and cat, they've got this problem. And even the pigeons, there's a code in San Francisco, you do not want to pay, feed the pigeons because you're worried about obesity in your birds and they can't even get off the ground. <laughs> so it's an issue that's germane not only to humans, but to the animal population that we deal with, even in our own homes. So being big is not always what we think of as in the past as being healthy and the consequences to it. So how do we define obesity? It's basically, there's many terms for it, but basically it means having eaten until fat. And that's essentially what one thinks of. And there's an, an extreme that's important here that one gets to, and we're going to look at it in terms of you can look at, I'm sure everybody's looked at ideal weight, cha uh, weight charts to see based on your height and your age, because the insurance companies use this as a way of, of dealing what type of premiums you're going to pay and what risk factors. But the way that we define it today across the globe is what is called the body mean mass index. Basically, it's a ratio of your height in meat in basically, or, or your weight, I should say, over your meter squared. And you can look at tables, you go on the internet, and you can look for these BMIs, and you can calculate it. I did mine, and I'll tell you what mine is, and I'll see what you think of it. And then what we define overweight is a BMI over 25. What we define is over obesity, defined by the CDC, as well as around the, with the World Health Organization, is essentially a BMI of greater than 30. And obesity, or overweight, is the most common en energy uh, homeostasis disorder in our human population. It's a problem of energy balance. Energy we store, it's almost thinking of like potential energy versus kinetic energy. You have to have a balance between these two of the stores that you have and expending that energy that's required by the body. That balance needs to be maintained and it changes as the time we're born to the time we begin to crawl to the time we're a child, adolescence, early adulthood, middle age, and the twilight years or the elder years that we may call it. I'm approaching that and I feel great. It's great to get older. You're more efficient. Have you noticed you're more efficient when you get older? No? Uh, I have three kids. 
three, uh, four, eight, and eleven. They keep me efficient and multitasking all the time. I don't have time to eat. And the other thing is, and this is the critical thing, why is this important? Obesity, the second leading cause of premature preventable death in the United States is now obesity. That's second. What do you think is number one? Smoking. And if you're smoking and obese, we really have a problem because the life expectancy is dramatically shortened in these individuals. And I've done autopsies on individuals who are obese in their 40s and 50s, young individuals that had shortened their life. And we'll look at the consequences in the inside of what happens when we think of obesity. Now, when you look at these index, you can now correlate it, and this is what they've done, is to disease risk based on your BMI. So the first one, your underweight is 18.5 and you have an increased risk. So being too thin is not good either. So there's a balance. Each one of us has what is called a, a lipostat, a set point for our body weight and mass. And it will vary based on the physiologic needs in your ontogeny or development during life. Normally it's 18.5 to 24.9, and then overweight is 25.0 to 29.9. I'm 29.1, so I'm considered Overweight. Now, overweight, you have to be careful because some people is because they have more muscle mass and bones relative to the fat. So this is just, it's a rough approximation. Then what is considered obesity? Well, it depends. Now they've stratified obesity based on the BMI. So you have obesity type 1, type 2, and you can see that the risk goes up as the BMI goes up from high to very high. And then obviously there's people over 40. BMI, and that's basically extremely high risk for disease. And we'll look at the consequences that one has to deal with when we see this type of high uh, weight. Now, when we talk about obesity, we have to look at some general concepts, and that is the total energy balance is food intake, what you stored energy or potential energy. I always think of it like a physics problem, if you think about it, versus the energy expended or the uh, kinetic energy that one is going to be released in response to the store. Now obesity is very different. We have to, fat is not when you're going to, when you come away from this talk, I hope you get the impression because I learned a lot about this. When you have to give a talk and teach somebody, you learn more than the student at times and light bulbs go on your head, is that when you look at fat, fat is different depending upon where it is in the body. And fat is just not only just a storage site. As you're going to see, fat is a, a complex tissue. It's an endocrine organ, and when we define an endocrine organ, it means this is an organ that secretes compounds that will control other organs, and one of the organs it controls is our brain. And you're gonna see how it controls the brain, and if that communication is lost, in certain families, there's a genetic predisposition to develop obesity or overweight. And so when you look at somebody, you have to think of what, are the, what is the genetic component. So everyone says that visceral fat, central fat, is the bad fat. Okay, you're going to hear this, versus the subcutaneous fat or peripheral fat. If you take sumo wrestlers, and everyone's seen a sumo wrestler, they have a unique way of gaining weight. What they gain the weight is in the subcutaneous fat. And how they do this is a very strict regimen of starvation in the morning. They train during the afternoon, and then they have a feeding frenzy. And because the way they eating pattern, they will distribute the fat not in the visceral. What I mean by visceral is fat that surrounds your other organs, your intestines, your heart, your liver. And I brought a heart to show you what, what fat looks, around, looks like around your heart. And so basically, that fat is not deposited in sumo wrestlers. But if they, they, have, they don't get hypertension or diabetes, they, they basically are much more fit, and they have a lower amount of visceral fat. Even though they look bulky on the outside, they can basically lose that fat eventually. Now, if they continue to eat without doing the, tra uh, doing the training or doing the activity of sum sumo wrestling, then they will eventually get morbid obesity and then develop diabetes and heart disease, as we'll see. So when you and I, the central obesity, or the fat is important. Men have more of this than women initially. Women, because of their pelvis, the, it's basically, you think of the subcutaneous fat as a depot site of storage. 
to be called upon later on because women for reproductive life. It takes, any woman will tell you, it's a very uh, energy dependent process during every month and then if you get pregnant the energy demands go up tremendously and that's why the body weight goes up but then what happens after pregnancy it's not required anymore and it's lost within several weeks to months depending upon how much weight is obtained and so the doctor is telling the pregnant woman be careful with your weight because you don't want to go too high because then it will interfere with the pregnancy and cause problems and can lead to a diabetic state when you're pregnant it's the visceral fat and if you think about it it's the one that's closest to your intestines. When you eat, where do you think the first place is going to be deposited? Is in the visceral area or the beer belly you see in men. And that's why men have a predisposition to develop that beer belly and that visceral fat. And when you see the abdomen protruding, it's not the subcutaneous, it's the visceral fat. Because you have a, what is called the omentum, an apron. We all have aprons internally that drape over our intestines. And it becomes much thicker and deposited fat as a function of time. And so when you run and exercise, you decrease the visceral fat, and that's the good part, uh, versus the uh, subcutaneous. That'll go down as well because your, your energy expenditure is now increased. So exercise is a critical element no matter what age. doesn't mean you have to become a marathon runner at the age of 90, but you have to do some form of exercise to help maintain that balance. So the visceral fat is the one that's a problem with, we'll talk about insulin resistance and diabetes and how it affects just wrapping around the organs and interfering GI tract because one of the problems of being obese is it slows down your GI tract and you have to worry about constipation as an issue. Because you can imagine if you put padding into something and your bowel has to move, you, anytime you could hear somebody, if you have somebody you put your ear on their belly after a meal, you'll notice it's very active. The intestines are moving around, it's bubbling and gurgling. That's good. So when you don't hear the noise, then it's a problem. It's like with children. If they're quiet, then there's something going on. <coughs> you know, same thing in the bowel. And so you can imagine that this has to basically, having that fat is going to interfere with the digestive tract. It takes longer to digest food, therefore you're going to have problems dealing with it as one example. So the visceral fat is what we consider the fat that has to be, become under control. So the fat, depending upon where it's located, has a big difference in how in terms of biochemically and physiologically to the response of the rest of the body. Now the etiology of obesity is complex and multifactorial and I'm going to look at three of these and discuss this to illustrate how important it is to be, understand the whole complexity of obesity to understand what are the factors that lead to it because that's critical to prevention and to maintaining body weight throughout life that's going to provide a healthy, uh, healthy environment. One of the things is it is a genetic factor. There are genes that are now being mapped out that so far six or more have been found that they found in, the verse, in people who have obesity running in their families. It represents in the humans about eight to ten percent of the human population is obese has a genetic predisposition to it to begin with. So that's one factor. And we'll look at what are the genes involved in the regulation of fat and how if they're abnormal, you're born with a mutation in them, will can then lead to obesity. Another important thing is environmental factor. And I'll show you examples. We've all seen it every day. You just walk out. You see it on the TV, the internet, out on the street, driving. You see it everywhere. The influence to eat more. Supersize. Another important thing is it's psychological and behavior because we learn our eating habits if you think as, as a child growing up in your family and how, what type of foods were presented to you at every meal and how the meal was part of the culture and each society and each culture has a different way of using the meal as a way of gathering but also to provide at the end of a day on a farm for example it's hard work they come in they eat quite a bit of meal because they have a hard day and they've expended a lot of energy now they gotta restore themselves in order to get ready for the next day when they wake up at four four o'clock in the morning to feed the chicken, milk the cows, and begin the whole process again. But there's unfortunately less people doing that type of work, so we have other issues to deal with. So psychologically, people use food as a comfort. It's like a blanket. You eat it when you're sad, I'll eat some chocolates, I'll eat some bread, I'll eat some jelly donuts, and maybe that'll make me feel better. So it's used as a, basically, a self-treatment. And because everybody else is eating it and they're enjoying it, why shouldn't I have it? 
So you have all these factors that are involved in this. And we're going to look at this. Now, let's look at, at what has happened over the course of time. Why? And let's look at the United States. And these are graphs that I found from the CDC that you can download. If you look in 1992, you'll notice based on the colors here, the darker the color, this is in terms of the BMI where they're looking at being overweight. You can see the states here in the north, the, the basically Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and in the south, like Louisiana, Mississippi, and uh, Georgia. Then as time proceeds, 1995, you notice it's starting to spread across the country as the number of people are becoming overweight. Then the year 1998, three years later, now you see it even expanding. It's from the East Coast to the West Coast. And even look at Alaska. Even though it's very cold, what else do you have to do when it's cold out there most of the time? You're going to be eating. And then unless you're an Eskimo and you're out there looking for food, but then the problem even with Eskimos have a problem with obesity because now they get access to it as well. Then you go to the year 2004, only three years ago. Now you notice there's only one state left that's not red. And we do have a problem that's occurred in the last 12 years. And it's made an impact on, our, on how we look at this. This is something that has gone on and we need now to take care of it. And that's why having these type of talks are important to become educated. It empowers you and you know what you need to do to deal with the situation. Let's look at obesity prevalence by gender. And over the course, these were surveys since 1960, 62. These surveys were conducted by the, the uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination. They have various surveys. If you look at men, you'll notice this is 1962. And then around the year 1980, it started, basically 1988, started going up. And they say, what is happening? And it also, it's the same time for women. And here it is for both sexes. You can see being obese, it's now one-third. A dietary change. Some people, if you look at soda, how many people drink soda? Be honest, one of my friends. I drink a little root beer once in a while too. What they replaced in soda was fructose. And that fructose change occurred when? In the 1980s. And so, because people are drinking a lot of sodas, this is one of the things you have more caloric intake. What about one of the things that in our life, we know we have very busy lives. And if you look at basically people who have no leisure physical activity time, go run, go jog, you notice it's based on your high school education. That when you don't have a high school, less than a high school education, 50% of the time, you, you basically have no leisure time because you've got to make the bills. You're, walk, you're working two or three jobs at the same time. And that's not good because stress can lead to obesity. And when you look at all adults, you can see the leisure time, about a little less than a third, do not have enough time to deal with their own personal physical activity that's important. And this becomes important as well. So you can see it's multifactorial. Another thing is income and obesity by state. And you might ask, which is one of the fattest states or states based on income is Louisiana and Mississippi. Colorado and Connecticut have the lowest rate. And so even if you take the statistics of income by state and obesity, it is correlated. Because the quality of food that you're exposed to in the urban settings, settings where you have a lot of people, is basically a lot of rich caloric intake and very little physical activity. And now you're setting up a situation of obesity. Another thing is, if you look at now prevalence of overweight in children, the same thing you can see from the time you're 2 to 5, 6 to 11, 12 to 19, it goes up roughly the same time when you've introduced all these sugar content type of base of foods and then vending machines in schools. But what has now happened, remember you get cupcake sales and PTA, remember that in school? That is now banned. It's banned throughout the United States as part of the wellness uh, program that PTAs cannot raise money or have cupcakes or birthdays in the classroom because of the issue of its food that people are just consuming only and nothing else and then trying to promote a healthier uh, diet. Another important thing is 
what do we have to go to the supermarket? And what, you can just walk in a supermarket and you say, look, or go outside and you get these fast food places. Look at that, stacker combos. Look how tall. The taller it gets, the better it gets. And look at this, Krispy Kreme donuts. And it says, J bonus pack. You get a bonus for buying this carton. And then it says up here, if you like chocolate, Ghirardelli, triple chocolate. If you're really a chocolate fiend, we'll give you more. The more is better. And then you have to worry about this advertisement, Jumbo, eat, you're hungry. They're telling you you're hungry. You look at it, you must eat it. And then it says, so big it could be the sixth burrow. That's what it would need, a burrow. <laughs> and then you see, look at this, new, bacon, double, home style, melt. Well, that'll melt all right. Melt right into your fat. And so we're constantly being bombarded by the environment. And when you take a critical look at how they're advertising, where they put it in the supermarkets at the ends or at the checkout, there's a reason for it, to get you to purchase it. So there's a psychological warfare that's going on to convince you you're not eating enough. And then if you look at the, ten, the trends and prevalence of high school students taking P PE class, and you notice over the course of years from 1991 to 2003, you remember PE class in high school, right? You had it all four years. Now it's an elective. You can choose to opt out out of it. Now look at what you see in terms of taking PE. And it goes down as the farther you go. I didn't leave the uh, grades, but basically you can figure out. Basically the older you get, you say, ah, it's PE, it's not for me. I don't want to run that lap. I don't want to go to gym. And you can see as the grade, it goes lower in terms of activity. And that's an issue. So PE is now being reintroduced back into schools because they know the physical activity is critical in terms of, of a balanced mind and body to do well in terms of learning. So energy balance, regulation. Now we've seen some of the components. How do we take hold of this and understand what's going on in our brains? What tells us to eat? How many people had dinner already? Okay, you feel full, you feel satisfied, right? How many people have not had dinner? And you're waiting until this talk is over and say, oh, I'm going to make maybe a little meal tonight, nothing too big. Just enough to make me feel good, right? Well, when we think of when you sit down and have a meal, there's many things going on biochemically. It's telling you to eat because it's an important to understand. There are three components to how we look at energy regulation balance. One, we have an afferent system that tells us signals from our stomach and from our fat when to eat. We're under constant control, believe it or not, by these tissues. So there are signals that are molecules that are transmitted. Fat is an endocrine organ. It is releasing hormones. It's telling your brain it's time to eat. Plus it's cultural because you grew up. Some people in Latin America, they eat at noon is the heaviest meal. Here in the United States, it'll be basically at six, seven, five o'clock. Or some people eat a heavy meal in the late evening, they have a meal at 11 o'clock in Europe, for example. So there's various ways in which cultures look at this. So in the, this basically uh, leptin is a hormone that's made by the fat that goes to the brain and basically it basically is going to tell you to suppress your appetite. Because as the fat gets bigger, it will tell the brain, says we don't need any more, stop. Then you have uh, ghrelin that goes up before you eat. It starts to go up and it's produced by your stomach. Your stomach cells are get released this from cells that line your stomach and the body of the stomach that goes into the blood, goes to the blood through the blood brain barrier like leptin, and it tells the brain we need to eat. I'm hungry. Okay? Now this becomes important because when people, one of the ways to treat obesity is to do a uh, removal of part of the stomach. It's not the size you're decreasing, because the stomach can stretch. Because you reduce the stomach, you decrease the amount of grimulin. Therefore, it tells you you don't need to eat as much. And therefore, you will use your energy stores, your potential energy, and you'll lose your weight based on that type of what is called bariatric surgery. Okay? And then insulin from the pancreas. It also is important because it's going to be on the fat cells. We'll talk about insulin and diabetes in this very uh, intimate relationship that when the insulin, it drives sugar into cells like muscle, your heart, your liver, and fat cells. 
And that's why insulin is important. If you don't have insulin, or insulin doesn't tell, if the cell does not respond to insulin, it can't keep up the sh take up the sugar, so therefore you get a high sugar level in your blood. Now you have diabetes mellitus, which means sweetened with honey. Now, in the brain, as you're going to see, the hypothalamus integrates these signals that are coming in and then tells what we call the effector system. It tells the body to do several things. It tells you to eat when you're hungry. It tells you when you're full, when your stomach gets full. The gremlin level drops during your feeding. When you had supper, it started to drop as you ate. And it told the brain, slow down. You're reaching your capacity. And then you will elicit other hormones who will tell your cells, hey, there's energy about source of energy, we will now consume it in, throughout cells in your body. You ever notice when you read a lot or you're doing a lot of intellectual thinking, you're, you get an appetite? Well, the reason is, is you're using all that glucose. What, what does your brain use? It uses a half a pound of sugar a day just to function as a brain. And that's why when students always get the munchies when they're studying is because they're really using it. It's being used by the brain to make those memory connections for that material and learn the information. So it's tightly correlated with this. Now, if you were to look in the system, it would look something like this as a diagram. And when you look at the regulation, here you can see the fat cells. They're releasing leptin, and then there's insulin from the beta cells that are in your islets of the pancreas. And the pancreas has a million islets. As an adult, you have a million islets. 70% of those cells make insulin. And so insulin is released during your meal because of the glucose coming through the blood supply to say we need to get it into adipocytes, we'll see the regulation of this, or into the liver and to store it until we need it. And you can see the fat is sending out leptin that's going to go to the brain and it tells it to do, there are two basic ways of the way you think of how things are made in the body and broken down. When you make things, we call it anabolic pathways. You're taking a large, you're taking basically a small molecule making the bigger. So you can take energy and now store it as fat. Then when you say catabolic, you're taking large molecules like fat or other sugars and breaking it down to smaller molecules to be utilized by the rest of the body. So what you see here is that when you release these signals, gremlin and leptin both go to the brain, you can see that when the fat cells make a lot of these, they're going to cause a positive effect to say, we need to break down what you have. We do not need any more, and so therefore we'll shut the brain down and tell it we're not hungry. And so this regulation is very important. We'll see the complexity within the brain in a moment, in another slide, how this works out. Then you can see on this that by these various mechanisms of positive, how much food you take in during the meal or when you snack, what inhibits it, the catabolic, to the breakdown. You want to inhibit this because you're breaking down your internal stores. You don't need any more. Here, energy expenditure. Here, we need to expend energy to break it down. And then at the same time, we have the anabolic that's going to be basically in preventing it. And then we have this energy balance, and then this will, based on other hormones, will go back to the fat, back to the stomach, and tell you you're okay until the next meal or until you need your energy stores. And you can see when you think of a diet and what you're trying to lose, it's more complex than just saying, I'm just going to eat this or that. You have to really approach it and think of what's going on. It's very complex. And then all the visual cues to the brain, like seeing super size, and you're going to see that this is going to influence this as a psychological and behavioral input to the head that's going to t affect these centers as well. So it's very complex when you think of how you use energy in the body and when you store it and when we need it. And this goes on 24 hours a day when you're asleep and when you're awake and doing your normal activity. Now let's go into the, the part of the brain that's critical that sets this whole process up is the hypothalamus. And if you go into the hypothalamus, it gets even more interesting. Say it's more than what you bargained for it, I'm sure. It looks complex, but it's basically, you think of it, you have a system that's going to break down molecules in the body and use them, and they're going to, those are going to build it up and store it. And those same molecules that we made from the fat and the stomach are going to have different effects on these two systems. You have neurons in the brain, which is part of the arcuate nu uh, nucleus, and there are, the leptin binds to it, 
And then there's receptors that tell this neuron, the first neuron in this pathway, to send out what is called alpha um, melan uh, melanin-stimulating hormone that has a receptor, which is melanin cortical 4 receptor, that tells this pathway, the autonomic nervous system, to stimulate the release of catecholamines. You get energy like from your adrenal gland. And endocrine, where you, you, you release thyroxin, which is a hormone from your thyroid. This is a, t, a, thy a thyroid-releasing hormone is in your pituitary, it tells your pituitary from your brain to tell your thyroid to make thyroxin and release it, and that increase the mean metabolic rate of all your cells in the body. So it will consume this energy, and then there's cortisol, a cortical releasing hormone that will affect the adrenal gland to release catecholamines that will stimulate this whole process as well. So you're going to use energy. That's good. Then you have this other side where it's anabolic, you have what is called neuropeptide Y that has a receptor and there's behavioral uh, pathways that affect this and there are these that will tell you to make, to take in more food. And if you ask the question, what is the problem in certain people that have a genetic predisposition to obesity, which pathway you think is the biggest problem is this one, where you inhibit it. You don't use the energy. And so the genes that have been responsible, there are some people that basically don't have enough leptin from the fat. They don't have the receptor to bind to it. Because there are mice that they, you see on newspapers or in the literature that talk about they were obese. They discovered leptin when they realized that these mice didn't make enough of it and they got fat. They just keep eating and eating and eating and there was no control over it. Most people who have genetic predisposition have a, a problem with this receptor on the second neuron. That accounts for probably about 8 to 9 percent of obesity due to genetic underlying cause. And so this is the problem that we uh, have found. There's probably more than these genes. As time goes on and molecular techniques are improved and dissecting out these pathways, this is a very simplified uh, version of how the brain interacts with the environment and with our stomach and our fat in terms of telling it when to eat and when not to eat and when to stop eating based on how much energy stores that one sees. So you can see it's a delicate balance. So let's talk about insulin. Where does insulin come from? We think of the pancreas and it's going to be, has three effects on three major organ systems. It affects the fat cells and what does it tell it to take up? The sugar that's broken down from your gut is basically to take it up into the fat and you, we make fat, we call the term lipogenesis. We're going to make fat and store it. So what's going to happen to the size of the fat cells they're going to get? Bigger. But there's, do you think they can just go infinitely get bigger and bigger and bigger? No, there's a problem with that. It may feel that way to you, but it isn't and we'll see why. Because if they get too fat, too big, they will, they will break down and explode at the cellular level, and that's bad. And we'll talk about what happens. They'll degenerate, because even that cell, if it has so much fat in it, it will cause a problem. And we'll get back to those trans fatty acids. Remember that they put on packages now that zero. We'll explain why it's not good in a minute. It also, insulin will affect the muscle. It will, because muscle needs glucose, so it stores it as glycogen. And so you get glycogen synthesis, you're storing it until you need it because certain muscle fibers use it right away like a sprinter versus a marathon runner. You're using it against gravity as we're sitting here. You're using sugar right now by your muscles to maintain your posture. So you're constantly using sugar. And so this, uh, the fat, just go back here, it, break, it stops breaking down fat, you store it. And then protein synthesis because you have more glucose and now you can synthesize things so you have more contractility. Proteins, actin, and myosin. And then what is the liver going to do? It stops making sugar. It decreases the amount of sugar that it releases to the rest of the body. It will store the sugar as glycogen. That's the storage form. And then it will also increase lipogenesis. Because lipid, remember, has more caloric energy, 9 kilocalories, versus uh, carbohydrate, which is roughly f uh, 4. Okay? And so this is how one sees this. Now, remember those trans fatty acids that everybody put in a package? We've got to read the fine print because some of those packages still have trans fatty acids in them because they're hydrogenated. So why is that fat bad? Is because of its molecular configuration. When it enters the fat cells, it's like a piece of plastic. 
and you get more of this plastic, it will injure the fat cells and cause them to break down. And in doing so, this breakdown, as the fat gets accumulates in the adipocytes, well, you're going to get an inflammatory response. You don't feel it. You don't have a fever, like you have pneumonia or strep throat or appendicitis. So what's going to happen is, is that macrophages, these are cells that are part of our immune system, come in and then it will start, basically they, they are scavengers. They're phagocytic. They love to eat. They'll eat anything that's dead. A lot of the things that die in our body with our trillions of cells, these guys are in there all the time eating. But they do one other thing that's very important as part of their function, is they release cytokines, molecules that will affect other inflammatory cells and affect other organ systems. And that is going to be a problem in terms of leading to heart disease, coronary artery disease, hardening of the arteries. And we'll show you some of these to illustrate what happens. And because this is a chronic disease, it will, you will not feel hardening of the arteries. You will see the consequences of it, a heart attack or an aneurysm in the aorta that ruptures and you exsanguinate because of this destruction that's taken place over decades of neglect and insight into it. So just to mention in terms of there's different types of diabetes. The most common form of diabetes that one comes across is type 2 and versus type 1. Type 1, they both have a genetic component. The one that has the largest ge genetic component is type 2. Type 1 is an autoimmune disease. You basically have a gene genetic predisposition that you, your body looks at the islet cells and they say they're abnormal. And some other environmental trigger like a viral infection will then set off the immune system to not only attack the virus but now attack your islets. So now it destroys the insulin producing cells and therefore your glucose goes up and you have the consequences of too much glucose. Then the type 2 diabetes is the one that's most common in the population associated with obesity. And how is it associated? As the fat cells get bigger, especially the visceral fat, the number of insulin receptors go down. So if you have less receptors up there, that means there's less insulin that can now bind and tell that cell to take up the glucose. So now if you don't take up the glucose, what happens? Now you have diabetes. That's why one of the ways of controlling type 2 diabetes is to do what? Lose weight. And that's how one of the approaches to controlling type 2 diabetes. And I say, well, why is this happening to us? Well, if you think about populations that are affected, if you go back in time or humankind and think of history, you, the highest population of people who have diabetes are Native American Indians. The second is Hispanic. And in my family, on my father's side, at least three of his five siblings have had diabetes mellitus and they've lost their eyes. One died from complications. Okay. And so the next population is African American, then Caucasian, and Asian population. Now, what's the, what, why are these populations selectively? There's a genetic predisposition. If you go back in time, what were Native American Indians, Hispanics, and African Americans, and all these different continents, is they were migratory populations. Food, there was no 7-Eleven, there was no internet. You had to go find it. And you had the women as food gatherers. They would get them as well, you have the hunters. And as the climate changed, you would move to different parts of the, the continent to look for those food. So you were very efficient biochemically in your cells to take up this whatever you had and you were able to go through life. But now modern progress comes along. You still have the same biochemical makeup, but now you don't have to travel to the uh, forest or to the desert to look for food. Now it'll come to you by click of a mouse. And now you oversaturate your biochemical pathways and they don't have know what to do with it but to do what? Store it. And now it leads to obesity. And so we were nomadic individuals. We were traveling all the time. But now with cars, subways, airplanes, you can go anywhere in the world versus Magellan, Cortez. It's a different time and it's leading to problems. Other types of diabetes where you destroy the pancreas, a chronic pancreatitis can be associated with obesity. We'll look at, I brought an example of a pancreas to show you what normal and abnormal looks like. Panc uh, if you remove a pancreas because of a tumor and because you remove the uh, pancreas, you're removing the islets as well. Because the other part of the important role of the pancreas is to make digestive juices or enzymes to break down your food. Drugs, who, people who take cortisol, 
can get diabetes because it causes gluconeogenesis and stimulation of glucose. So you can get diabetes from drugs. There is a problem where you have too much iron, a condition of iron overloading that destroys the pancreas. It's called basically hemochromatosis, basically increased iron stores leading to tissue damage. Then there are tumors that release catecholamines, a rare tumor. I always tell students, they always see this on exams, but not too often in patients. It arises from the medulla of the adrenal gland that normally makes cortisol, and cortisol will stimulate gluconeogenesis in the liver and release more glucose, and then you can get a diabetic state. So there's many ways to have an increased glucose level besides type 1 and type 2. But what we see in the population due to, is going to be type 2 diabetes. And these are the complications. And some of these are, are going to be a direct cause of the obesity that leads to diabetes that leads to the problem. One of the things when you think of diabetes and you think you're sweetened with honey and you think, well, what's all this sugar doing? It's not just sitting there. It's doing many evil things outside of the cells and inside the cells. And what are the evil things that it does to the cells? What, because cells interact, like we interact with our family or our coworkers, there are receptors. And what happens with all this glucose, you don't need an enzyme to put these molecules on these receptors that interact between cells. But now if you put these glucose molecules, it's called non-enzymatic glycosylation of proteins, now the interaction of cells are interfered with. So the metabolism changes because glucose goes into cells and you produce what are called polyalcohols. And it brings sodium into the cell. They become dysfunctional. So what happens in the brain, your blood vessels that have cells or endothelial cells that are important for the vascular structures is that they can break apart and you can lead to a stroke. And you don't feel this change occurring as a diabetic. It's a silent disease. Then what's the leading cause of blindness in the United States in adults is diabetes. Because that sugar is going through all the blood vessels in your retina and destroying those vessels and it damages the retina. You get scarring of the retina, it detaches your lens, and I mean your retina, and then you go blind. Then you go along what happens is it makes the hardening of the arteries, which we'll see in just a little while, that makes the arteries hard and firm. You ever been into an old house that you turn on the water in the rusty pump and you see all this brown gunk coming out of it? Well, that's what happens to your body as well when you have hardening of the arteries. And I'll show you what it looks like. And, okay? And then it leads to like atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries and leads to a heart attack in the heart. The hypertension, as we're going to see, what it does to the heart, it makes the heart work harder and it becomes much thicker and it's more prone to a heart attack or failing an arrhythmia as a consequence. And then what happens, bladder becomes a problem. It, it causes a sensory neuropathy or control of the autonomic nervous system. So you get a, what they call a neurogenic bladder. You can't empty your urine, so you're prone to infections and uh, issues that, that are occurring. And then the other thing is it affects your peripheral vessels, leading to atherosclerosis and hardening it leads to the gangrenous foot, the leading cause of amputation in the United States due to uh, non-traumatic means to the foot is due to diabetes mellitus. So you can see this is what the consequences because of those fat cells not having those insulin receptors as you get uh, down regulated as a consequence it's going to be uh, detrimental obviously to the individual. This is an example of an, a diabetic leg and you can see these are ulcers that will never heal. Because what happens in diabetics, you're immunocompromised. It will interfere with tissue repair. And so this becomes a real problem of increasing morbidity and mortality. When you have diseases, simple ulcerations, because it interferes with the tissue repair process. When you have diabetes, your wounds take longer. And so they have to be under con uh, constant vigilance in terms of the physician, caregiver, family members to make sure that that foot or leg in this case heals properly or otherwise you get an infection and we lead to amputation. The other thing with, with, with healing is pain. Pain is critical to healing. And if you don't have pain, which diabetics can walk along on the floor and there's a tack, they can step on it and they won't feel a thing. You step on a tack or I step on a tack, you have to scrape me off the ceiling because you'll go right up. So pain is important in terms of uh, repair and so it's altered in diabetics because it will affect the sensory nerves. Now, if someone were to ask, what are the problems, the pathology of, of obesity? The way you have to think of this, every organ system is affected. We have over 10 organ systems, so I'm going to show you examples of what are typical conditions, and we'll look at some of these to illustrate the point. One is the largest organ of the body is the skin. 
But when you have that much skin, the skin will stretch as a function of time. Any woman that tells you you got pregnant will say they've got the uh, stretch marks and you've got this uh, problem with the dermatitis because if you have so much fat, like we saw these people extremely fat, they will fold over and provide microenvironments for microorganisms. You can get yeast infections. It's going to be harder to clean or take care of uh, basically bodily hygiene. So you would have need people to help you take care of this or you have to worry about rashes and so forth because of this. Now what about all that weight? Who's going to take an impact on that weight, no matter where the fat is, is your joints. And I'll show you what happens to your joints. You get osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease. So the way you think about it essentially is that if I, my two fists are a joint in a joint space and there's fluid, we know from physics that fluid is non-compressible. And on the surface of each of these bones in your joint is cartilage. And what happens is as the weight increases, it now touches. And now when you move that joint, you're destroying that cartilage. It's like wearing down your brakes and then you start hitting the drum and scraping it and you've got to have the whole thing replaced or retooled and, and that's what's happening based on this. And this is irreversible. Once you destroy the joint, you now need a prosthesis, a metal prosthesis to replace the function of it. So the other thing is it affects gout, which is a problem where you have breakdown of uh, 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 uric acid crystals that get deposited as a consequence. Now what's going to be a problem with people who are overweight is their spine because what's taking care of all that weight? The mechanical force is your vertebral bodies. They will basically get intervertebral disc disease, herniate, they could herniate, cause nerve paralysis, sciatica, and now we've got a, now a debilitated state that's now going to further decrease their energy expenditure because of this. It becomes a vicious cycle because, uh, as a consequence. Let's go to metabolic. This is a condition that people are now recognized with obesity is what is called metabolic syndrome. And what does this mean? What does syndrome mean? Does anybody know what syndrome means? So the disease, there's a unique etiology that has a unique constellation of signs and symptoms. Now what is a syndrome? It has many etiologies, but the same presentation clinically. There are many more causes that have the same common pathway clinically and pathologically. And that's why we call it a syndrome versus having one etiology and unique set of signs and symptoms. So a syndrome is basically where you have these various things that's going to occur and you can see that abdominal obesity, the visceral fat, you get insulin resistance because the insulin receptors are going down. You have nowhere to get rid of the glucose and what happens is you get uh, diabetes. Then as a function, the liver will make triglycerides, so you make more. That's where the liver makes fat. So you're going to have a problem with affecting the gallbladder. It can lead to uh, gallstones, pancreatitis. Then you are, you're good cholesterol. Remember we talked about the bad, LDL is the bad, and, and then the LDL, the good, it goes down. The liver shuts it down for reasons that people are working out in this response to it. And what happens if you have more volume as tissue? What happens your blood volume? It goes up. Plus, because what happens is since insulin tells, when you give insulin, sugar goes in and potassium goes in, in order to keep electron neutrality, sodium comes out. And sodium, what, draws with, what goes with sodium is water that expand the volume and then lead to hypertension as a consequence. And then you increase the risk of heart of the arteries and a coronary artery, it can lead to a heart attack. And that's all the consequences of what we call a metabolic syndrome. Hyperlipidemia, insulin resistant, type 2 diabetes. Another thing is endocrine in women. Fat is an endocrine organ. One of the things it does is a source of estrogen production. You have inactive estrogen, men too, because if men have too much estrogen, what do you think develops in men? Breasts. We call that gynecomastia, get enlargement of the breasts. So even men have that female component to them. And so in this case, when you have so much fat, it causes inactive estrogen to be converted to active estrogen. And that's going to have an effect on the body. You get decreased testosterone, obviously that's going to be an issue in men. And then it also affects the brain and affects a problem with follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that affects ovulation. So what happens to the ovary, there's an imbalance. The ovary becomes cystic, like bubbles. 
cystic space, and it interferes and leads to infertility, and it produces more antigen from the, from the ovary, and now the woman gets heritism because of too much testosterone. So that's an issue. Cardiovascular. So you can see from hypertension, now we'll see this, I'll show you heart, what happens to your heart in terms of left ventricular hypertension. And what, if, what about a pump? If you had a pump heart all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, an obese patient, what's going to happen? You go into congestive heart failure. It'll eventually give out as you get older. And that becomes a problem. And then if that's not an issue, you can also dilate the chambers of the heart and it can't pump. We call this dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart increases in size, but it's less efficient as a pump. And then cardiovascular accidents, it can lead to problems with stroke, and it can lead to atherosclerosis and so forth. And it can also lead to thrombosis or a, th a blood clot essentially forming in a blood vessel that has atherosclerosis in the brain, and it leads to decreased blood flow to the brain, and the brain part of that part of the brain that's supplied by that vessel dies, we call it an infarct. Another organ system is the lungs. Now if you think of your chest cavity, and you think of this obese person, and I'll show you what, what, how, what obesity looks like. I got a section of fat to show you what it looks like. And basically, if you think obese person, morbidly obese, is about this thick, maybe 10 to 15 centimeters, and now you lay down, and this is basically this mass sitting on your chest, it's going to help your breathing. On the contrary, it's going to make you very difficult to breathe, and this has big consequences. And you can test this at home. You don't have to be obese to try this. All you have to do is lay down in bed tonight, take the Bible, a dictionary, anything you want, encyclopedia, put it on your chest and try breathing for five minutes. You'll know exactly what it is to be obese and the consequence. Hmm? Your cat. Or you can have an animal do it too. <laughs> and it's not a very comfortable, is it? After a while, it's like, I think you need to find another place on the bed. Not me. So one of the things is, how many people have read Charles Dickens, the Pickwick Papers? <coughs> you remember the, the person, the cab driver, that was obese? What were they always found doing? The cab driver was obese, and you were always sleeping all the time. And this can, obesity can affect your sleep centers and lead to sleep apnea. You actually have moments of stop breathing as a consequence of this. Because you can imagine this weight interfering with the mechanics of breathing during night and you're retaining CO2 and you have this whole problem. And that's why these patients have problems with breathing. And so when you see these people at work and you see them tired and sleeping at their desk is because they didn't get a good night's sleep. They've gone into sleep deprivation because of this whole process. So it becomes a very vicious cycle. That's why it's called Pickwickian syndrome. Snoring is another consequence. Another area is the GI tract. And one of the things is, uh, the uh, gallstones, I brought a gallstone, if you haven't seen a gallstone, how big they can get. And it's amazing, we make our own stones. Men get it in the bladder most of the time, or kidneys, and women get the gallbladder. But when you get obese, it doesn't matter. Every sex has their own stone. No one's left out, okay? Pancreatitis, because of the triglycerides, can cause damage to the pancreas. And uh, you get abdominal hernia, you can imagine all this visceral fast putting on your, your umbilicus. You can have your intestine pop out or, or hernias coming through the abdominal wall because all that bulk pushing on is going to go forward because your spine and all your muscles are causing. And then if you grunt and you're putting down, you can cause herniation. The other thing is, with, it's like w women who get pregnant. They always tell you about they get heartburn. And the reason is you're pushing against the stomach. Well, you have all this visceral fat, it'll collapse the stomach, and you get heartburn or reflux disease, inflammation of the esophagus. Urinary tract, you have all that weight pushing on your bladder. And so the problem is you're going to have moments where you're going to urinate when you don't want to. Incontinence is the term that's used because of this. Women will complain about during pregnancy the, of this whole issue. But it's a temporary condition versus uh, obesity. Gynecologically, women in reproductive life, it affects the menses because of the abnormal high amount of estrogen being made by the fat. It can also lead to infertility too because it'll interfere with the ovulation cycle as well. Then you think neurologically, it can lead to intracranial hypertension, but another thing that you always have to think about the individual that's obese is depression. Because think of them wanting to go outside and being part of the world, finding clothing being accepted by others and not being branded while well, you're fat because you're just lazy and you don't want to work and you've done this to yourself. And that's the wrong attitude because it's more than just that. It's not that. 
There are other reasons you've seen that are very important to help you understand this. Another thing is it can increase the risk for cataracts where your lenses become cloudy so you now can't see. It can lead to cancer. And there was a report out last month by the World Health Organization that obesity in the world is increasing the risk of various cancers from breast because breast has, it's estrogen dependent. It'll drive the cells to divide. If you have dividing cells, it will increase the risk for your mutations and cancer will arise. Well, if you think of the esophagus, the colon, prostate, the cervical, gallbladder, there are inflammatory mediators from those macrophages that are taking up the dead cells and they release and now cause cells to divide in these various tissues and now can lead to cancer as a consequence. And then, what happens if you want to get an operation for anything? There's a problem of being overweight or obese and that is one of the things that can happen during anesthesia is that you normally your lungs don't ventilate very well because they go through a process of collapse. We call that term atelectasis. Tell means what at the end? At the end of the lungs, the alveolar sacs are important for gas exchange without dilatation. I always tell students, especially medical students, what MD stands for. What does MD stand for? Metal dot, no, it means medical dictionary. That's what it really means. Because that's half the battle is going through the terminology and understanding what it means and now you know why they called it. It makes sense. Now, when you're obese, what's your energy level like, do you think? Very low. So you're sitting there in a chair, the bed, a wheelchair. What happens to your blood flow? It decreases. And what happens with decreased blood flow? It clots. And now you have a thrombus in your deep leg vein. It can break off and now go to your lungs, obstruct the pulmonary artery. You can't breathe. And you can infarct the lung where it dies or you have a sudden death. And I brought a lung to show you what a PE looks like to illustrate this process. And so constant moving is important for blood flow. If, it's, if it sits there, it can clot. And some people are more prone to do it. And if you're smoking at the same time, it causes injury and it'll accelerate the whole process. So that's why you move. Or if you think those tanks, there was a famous reporter three years ago who died of pulmonary embolus because he was in a tank for 15 hours covering the Iraqi uh, war. And he died of a massive pulmonary embolus. He was only 41 years old. So if you're in a confined area, confined where you're not moving, you're normally active, it can be a real problem, okay? Now, this is what degenerative joint disease looks like. And we look at it, this is the hip joint. This is the head of the femur. And here you see the acetabulum or the part of the hip. And this space is narrow. It's rubbing against bone. And when you take out the hip at hip surgery and you have to replace it with prosthesis, this is what the head looks like. But when this joint is now grinding against itself because of that weight, you notice this is the surface, this is what cartilage, instead of being smooth, it looks like somebody's been picking at it. It looks kind of rough and irregular. It should be smooth and glistening. But then you say, well, what's this? I see light shining on this. This is polished bone now. It has now been just completely destroyed, the articulating cartilage, whether it's your hands, your hips, weight bearing, your knees. So that's when you do a lot of repetitive type of activity, you wear out the joint and that's what's going to happen in obese is going to be basically on those joints that are, have to maintain that weight. Your knees, your hips, your ankles will be affected because of all this weight. Now if you cut the head to see what happens to the cartilage, it looks something like this. Here is the head of the femur. You can see the normal white cartilage, the articulating cartilage. And what do you notice about its thickness as you get closer to the top? What happens to it? It disappears. There is none. And now you have, and that's an irreversible process. And it's because of bone rubbing bone, or when your brake pads, you've got to change them, otherwise you're going to cost more money to replace it. Same difference, because it's worn down and now polishing it. And this is what it looks like microscopically. Here's the normal articulating cartilage. These are called chondrocytes that help maintain the cartilaginous makeup. And then what do you notice about the thickness? It's getting thinner and thinner as we get to the bone, and it's fissuring. It fractures and degenerates, but there's no inflammatory response. That's why when people use the term osteoarthritis, it's a misnomer. There is no inflammation that one sees. It's a degeneration to the cartilage as a consequence, in this case, damage due to excess of weight. Okay? All right. Now let's see what these organs look like. Now remember I told you about the subcutaneous fat. And when you think of a panectomy, does anybody know what a panectomy 
That's another name for a tummy tuck. You've heard of tummy tuck, right? So what, what does panis mean? It means a cloth, the covering. So this is what, when they remove the fat from the subcutaneous, this is the skin on the surface. Okay, this is where we're looking at the skin, and this is the yellow fat underneath. That's how thick this individual had fat. You can see how thick it is. From this to the skin on the surface, this is all subcutaneous fat. That whole thing is just a chunk of fat that's been removed. And you can see it. So I'm going to be a six-year-old child. And remember, like a six-year-old child, if you had a granddaughter or a grandson or a child coming in and ask you, why is the sky blue? I'm going to ask you, why do you think fat is yellow? Now, when you go to the store and look at the steaks, just look at them. You can have one or two. What do you notice about the fat of rind? What color is that? White. Okay. And when you buy lard to make tamales, usually it's, it's, it's white. So why is that lipid white and our fat is yellow? If you've ever gone to a restaurant and they provide you real butter, not margarine, you ever notice the color changes depending upon the year or the time of the year, not oxidation, then we have some real problem if it oxidizes, it becomes rancid, it won't taste very good. But you notice that the butter changes, it's yellow during the spring and the summer, but becomes paler in color. See, no one notices this, right? You get into dinner, I, I'm not going to worry about the color of this butter, I'm just going to eat it. And it turns pale to white during the winter and fall. Say, well, what's going on? Why is my butter changing in color? The reason is what you eat is what you are. And what are the, what are the things you probably refuse to eat as a child? Veggies, right? Now you say veggies is good. Well, they have lipid soluble pigments. If you, all those yellow pigments in the, like squash and things, guess what? They're lipid soluble. So if you're a vegetarian, your fat is fluorescent yellow. If you're a beef eater, you're like that cattle. It's being fed what? Grain to fatten them up. There is no pigment in that grain and that's why the butter changes because what are the cattle that are making the butter, the, what are they grazing on during the spring and the summer? Grass. Grass. And what are they giving in the fall and the winter? Grain. So the color of the cream changes based on what they've been eating. The same thing is true. If you drink too much carrot juice, what color will you turn? Let me go on the green. <laughs> orange because these are lipid these are called xanthobitous pigments and this is a new word it's great for scrabble is xantho means yellow so xanthobitous pigments in our vegetables get into our fat and turn it yellow so you can see this person had a few vegetables in her time so if you're a strict vegetarian you have fluorescent fat but it, you can come up and feel how much weight this is this is just one section of the body and if you put this on your chest and had this completely around it, you could see this would have a problem with breathing. Okay. Where did this come from? Usually because most people who do these type of operations are going to be around the abdomen depending upon the amount of fat, the subcutaneous fat. But this is not really addressing the visceral fat, this is the subcutaneous fat. So now you ask the question about liposuction. Liposuction is only taking the fat that's okay because it's the visceral fat that needs to be removed. Well, recently there have been some people in the world that have done operations that are now taking out the visceral fat around your intestines in your stomach to deal and see if that has an effect on how it affects obesity and maintaining body weight and to total energy stores. So this is what it looks like. I have two, two sections to illustrate this. And so this is basically for one person. So this is what they are, have to remove, okay? One of the issues that occurs, this is a lung that you can see. This is the left lung. We cut the lung parasagially. This is the upper lobe, the lower lobe. And that's what a pulmonary embolus looks like, this big blood clot that you see that's went into this lung. And that's, you can see this with, you can see this big large blood clot. Now you can't get blood to your, to your uh, lungs and that basically interferes and they could die because of pulmonary a lack of blood flow to it. But you can see here's a large pulmonary embolus that basically feels like a sausage or cord inside, inside the pulmonary artery that's going to the left lower lung. You can see this large thrombose vessel interfering with blood supply. And that's what a PE or pulmonary embolus looks like. It's a, it's a blood clot that travels from the site of origin, from your deep leg veins, now gone to your lungs. You can see this big. Now, another thing that can lead to problems 
in the when you're obese is cirrhosis. And does anybody know what the definition of cirrhosis is? Cirrhosis is scarring of the liver. It's like you're scarring your skin because of trauma. And so what's the most common cause of cirrhosis of the liver in the United States is alcohol, a toxin. But there are other causes, viruses like hepatitis B or C, where our immune system attacks the liver, even though we're trying to save the liver from the virus, causes scarring of the liver. And what, is, what does a normal liver look like, you might ask? It looks something like this. It's brown because of what iron is, or what metal is stored there? So I gave away the answer, iron. So I want to help you as much as I can. And you know, that's why your liver's brown. Next time you go to the market, look at cow's liver. It's brown because of the metal iron. We store it there. And this is what a normal human liver looks like, nice and smooth. And that's what it looks like. Now, what does cirrhosis look like? You've all seen a, a football or a basketball. It looks kind of lumpy on the surface. This is what it looks like. You know, because the liver you see these nodules? This is cirrhosis. These are regenerating. You could hurt somebody with this liver because it's all scar tissue. You cannot, I always tell students, try to put your finger through this liver and they cannot because it's scarred down. You get these nodules of regeneration in response to the injury and it's trying to recover. But in doing so, it interferes with the two main functions of the liver, which is synthesis and detoxification. And now the liver fails and the patient go, will die of hepatic coma because you can't get rid of nitrogenous uh, or the uh, waste products. So you can see the difference between a normal liver and a cirrhotic liver. And when you feel it, it's kind of real lumpy like a basketball or uh, football. And so this is irreversible because we know that scarring on our skin is irreversible. It's the same thing is true uh, when you get cirrhosis. And so when you're obese, that lipid will accumulate. And that's why this liver is, is yellow because it's accumulating lipid and now it's becoming cirrhotic, and that's what, you, what we call NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. You get de destruction to the hepatocytes because all that lipid accumulates, and it turns it, that's why it's yellow or paler. Is that the surface or is that That's a cross-section. The surface is right here. It feels like a, a football through the whole liver. And then because what happens to all scar tissues, it contracts, you get a very small contracted liver in the end stage, and then it fails. This is what a gallstone looks like. For those, it looks like an Easter egg, but it's yellow because that you get more uh, cholesterol throughout the body, and not only your blood, but also in your uh, hepatobiliary system where you concentrate the bile in your gallbladder, so it's super concentrated, high more cholesterol, and it looks like an Easter egg or a little bird's egg, and they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. They can be pigmented because they have bilirubinate, but this is one. And what do you think is better to have, a big stone or a little stone? What do you think is better to have, a big stone or a little stone? No stones. No stones. That's even better. <laughs> but if you had to have a stone, what would you prefer to have, a big or little? I have a mixture, all right? Because it's big like this, it will not pass into the cystic duct, into the common bowel duct, and cause obstruction or pancreatitis. So having big, it gets stuck there and sits there. So if it's small, it can get down and cause obstruction, and then you'll cause cholangitis or inflammation of the biliary tract. So this is what... One sees. Oh, this is average. They come in little, they can be very small. You can have uh, 50, 60, or just one or two, just depending upon your uh, chemistry in terms of how you precipitate it. What it's made out of is cholesterol, and then often there's a nidus, like you think of a geoid stone, there's a nidus that precipitates the crystallization, and it could be cellular debris, it could be a cholesterol uh, crystal. You can do this at home uh, with kids, you take, or you can do it yourself. Take a, a bowl of water, I mean a pot of water, boil it, and then put as much sugar or salt into it. Then take a string and put it in there, cool it down, it'll precipitate onto the string and you can have rock candy. It's one way of doing it. So it's a super saturated solution of cholesterol in the gallbladder and it makes stones. So that's what they look like, okay? Another thing that can occur, this is what your normal pancreas looks like. Your pancreas sits in your body like this. You're walking around with your pancreas at this, this location. This is the head, the tail, makes sense, and the body. And this is our normal pancreas. How fresh? It's fixed. It's been seen through many medical school generations. <laughs> No, it's been cut to look at the texture in the, in the inside. This is where your eyelets, uh, where your insulin is produced, is this, and it's surrounded by fat. 
How big is it? Actually, it depends on the size. Its weight is roughly about uh, 90 to 120 grams in an adult. So this is your size. It's shrunken down a little bit because it's been in formalin, but that's how it sits, right where it's located. Now, one of the things, what happens to your pancreas when it becomes damaged? This is now chronic pancreatitis. And I brought the, it's like going to a good restaurant versus a bad restaurant. The top restaurant is the good. The bottom one is scarred down. This is non-functional. This patient has now diabetes or as a consequence of wiping out the islets. And they form stones in the chronic pancreatitis. You can see these, the, the duct is distended and basically it's non-functional pancreas. So this is what this looks like. You can come up and feel it. Seeing is believing and feeling it. So here's the normal on top and the destroyed pancreas down below. And what's the most common cause in the United States now is basically alcohol or a stone, a small stone that gets trapped down there and causes damage. Now let's go to the cardiovascular system. This is the aorta and it's been opened up posteriorly. This is in a child to show what, when you were born running around and it's called an elastic artery because it does this. Every time your heart beats, it stretches. And you're looking at the, this is the thoracic aorta where it's going the blood vessels to your chest wall. And these are the blood vessels to your stomach as well as your small and large intestine and your two renal arteries on each side. And this is going down to your legs called the common iliacs. But this is what, it, when in a child, this is basically essentially why they call it elastic artery. Each time your heart pumps, it stretches. So this is normal, okay? I'll show you an adult looks like. Adult will look like something like you, like this. Got a bigger variant, but it's basically the same thing. And that's what you look like, okay? And it stretches too. It's like a rubber band. That's why they call it elastic artery. See, everybody worries about what you look like on the outside. I'd be more concerned about what you look like on the inside. Or a pathologist. <laughs> Okay, so this is normal. So now what does hardy of the artery looks like? It looks like this. And this is what obesity will do to the, because of those lipids and damage and hypertension. The most leading, one of the biggest problems that leads to hardy of the artery, looks like an old rusty pipe in one's house, doesn't it? But this isn't a human being. And so this is irreversible degeneration and calcification. You see the arteries to the legs become torturous because of the damage it won't stretch anymore. It's lost to the elastic recoil because it becomes, becomes non-compliant. Yes, sir. Now, one of the things that can happen because the weak, you have a high pressure system on the arterial side, because of the damage of the wall, it can balloon out. We call that an aneurysm and it can burst in the abdomen. And so this is an example of what of the, a normal versus a hardening of the arteries. That can start as early as birth or it can occur as early, usually is what is called fatty streaks. We get accumulation of these fatty streaks, lipid accumulating the intima, which is the lining, and it's reversible. Exercise, diet, all these things, not smoking, watching your blood pressure, diabetes will accelerate this as a consequence of the sugar damaging the lining of your a wall and leading to this irreversible damage. What about the heart? One of the consequences of hypertension, here's a normal heart, you notice it has fat around it. We all have a certain amount of fat around our heart. Our heart sits in it like this. It's it actually, like a corkscrew, pumps the blood out. And I have the right chamber of the heart and the left. So you're looking at the normal insides of the heart. The right side of my right hand, and you see the valves. These are the ventricular chambers. So this is what your heart looks like. Your valves are about, you have four valves. They're about the thickness of one sheet of paper. And they have to last you for a hundred years or plus more. They're on one sheet of paper. They're eight vascular structures. The left side is thicker than the right because it has a higher pressure than the right side going into the lungs. So this is normal. We'll see what happens when you have obesity and hypertension. Now, if you have blood pressure, it builds up. If this is a normal heart and I'm holding the, the left side and here's the right side, this is normal. This is what happens to the left side of the heart when your blood pressure goes up. This whole thing is the left ventricle. It's become muscular. See how thickened in wall? Look at the size of the chamber that has to pump out the blood to the rest of the organs. It's decreased. So the ability 
to get enough blood to your tissues decreases. And you can see a thick wall compared to the one centimeter. And this is somebody who has hypertension. And you can imagine this in a patient who, has, who is obese, has hypertension. This is how their heart is working. At this point, no. And then it's arrhythmogenic. You can have a lethal arrhythmia any time and die suddenly. Or it's ischemogenic because you have to supply so much oxygen nutrients, you could have a heart attack at any moment. So this is the difference of, because the heart has to work harder against this increased pressure. So it's going to get hypertrophied or thickened. And you don't feel this at all. At this point, non-reversible because it's damaged the heart so extensively. So you can see the difference. Yes. Then what you, then, then the question becomes, what do you have to do is you gotta decrease the blood volume. One way to do it is to get rid of sodium. And what do you get is thiazide diuretics. That's one way of, of maintaining. So then that in conjunction with other drugs, so then the heart does not have to work as hard. Okay? Yes. Well, they may be short of breath as the end stage of the lesion, but when they, they don't feel it developing. Now, here's another heart. It went the other way. It dilated. So here's a person with hypertension due to, uh, uh, due to uh, obesity, and here's a normal heart for comparison. So let's see if I got this right. Left is left. I'm going to make this. Yeah, this is what is called dilated cardiomyopathy. Instead of the heart becoming thicker, it dilates. Look at the size of the chamber compared to normal. I'll flip it around so you get the orientation. It gets bigger, the heart, but now the, the heart is non-efficient because it's got such a big chamber and the walls become thinned out, it becomes inefficient as a pump. So it becomes less contract. The contractility goes down and therefore basically it dilates and you have an arrhythmia and they go into congestive heart failure as a consequence of this. So you can see the difference between normal and so the obesity, increased blood volume and the hypertension, all of these things can have different consequences in patients. You can see the difference between a normal one and dilated. The other thing I want to talk about is we think of a disease process like obesity. You look at somebody and they're big. You can tell this is an elephant, right? You have no question. So when you look at somebody and you think they're obese, you may not be correct. And this is another issue of being big, is that it may not be to obesity at all. And then you make assumptions, and it becomes a real problem in terms of the care. And I'd like to share a case in the few minutes we have left to illustrate this point. The case is a 46-year-old woman with a history of morbid obesity, and I put it in quotes because they thought she was big because of obesity. She has chronic respiratory insufficiency, and we talked about the effect of obesity. She has atrial fibrillation where the right ventricle is basically fluttering. It's not efficient in terms of the pump getting it to the ventricular chamber and goes to an outside hospital for a panectomy, tummy tuck, because that was the assumption. But pre-surgical, because before every surgery you have to have a physical, right? They found that she had a, her right heart was severely big. It was failing as a pump, okay? She transferred to UCSF for further workup. She never got the panectomy. Then she was giving diuresis, diuretics, to get rid of fluid, and she lost 60 kilograms of fluid, or 132 pounds, over about several weeks. That wasn't fat reduction, was it? She probably weighed up close to about 300 pounds initially. She lost, and I'll show you what happens. She develops acute renal failure because you take that much fluid, it's going to affect on the intravascular volume and it starts to shut down because the kidney has to have, you just can't take off fluid and expect the other organs to deal with it. So she started going to acute renal failure. Four months she's in a hospital. Four months without a diagnosis. Okay? You can imagine what the hospital bill is at $3,000 a day. Okay? And she's deteriorating. Her heart is failing. An echocardiogram shows, this is basically ultrasound to the heart, shows that she has severe right ventricular enlargement and the heart wall can't work. It's dilated like I showed you that one heart. 
And because the heart can't work, the pulmonary arterial pressure is increased because it's just failing, going into the lungs. So that's what the right heart is pumping into the lungs. She has cardiac catheterization and her pressure is 70 over 44. This is systolic over diastolic. The normal pressure in your pulmonary artery, you and I, is 25 to 10 millimeters of mercury. So that right heart has some problem going on pumping into the lungs. What is it? She develops chronic renal failure and now is in the hospital and she's on renal dialysis. Blood cultures, like anything, you have to worry about being in a hospital, a nosocomial infection. And she gets Staphylococcus aureus. And then she basically passed away on day 155 in the hospital with the, the thought that she still had obesity. Now she comes to autopsy and we're trying to understand what is going on. So when she came to autopsy, this is her belly. And I'm an autopsy pathologist, and so this is the gift of this patient to educate you about when you see somebody who's big, don't think they're obese. There are, many, there are other reasons for making it big, the individual. This is her belly. And the resident at the time, we trained residents how to do autopsy, came down and told me we had this morbidly obese patient. And I went down and looked at it and I said, no, this patient is not morbidly obese because you looked at the extremities and they were normal. And with her distension, she had 26 liters of fluid in her abdominal cavity. That's basically a little over six gallons of fluid that accumulated because that right heart wasn't functioning. It was backing up into her blood vessels, increasing the pressure, and all this fluid was backing up and basically dumped into her, into her abdominal cavity. When at autopsy, when you look at this, this is her abdominal cavity, her small intestines removed, this is her colon, this is her stomach, that's the normal shape of your stomach, and this is the liver. And the liver became cirrhotic because of this chronic congestion. Now remember that fat I just showed you, how thick it was? If you look here, this is her abdominal wall fat. It was only two centimeters thick. Two centimeters. It was not morbid obesity. Then this is our heart. And here, remember, I showed you with the left and right. This is the left side. Look at the size of her right side of her heart compared to her left. It's huge. And it's non-functional. It dilated because it was failing as a pump. And all the blood was backing up into the system. This is a normal lung to show you the normal alveolar walls. Here's the airways going down. This is a nice normal lung. This is the pulmonary artery providing blood with gas exchange from the thin, delicate alveolar sacs. This is what her lung looked like. Her alveolar sacs, you can see, are very thickened, and you see the capillary bed is engorged with blood because the blood can't get through the capillary system. And the left side of the heart was completely normal. And then because of the blood congestion, it spilled out into the alveolar sacs, and she had hemorrhage, and these are macrophages that we talked about. They're in your lungs, too. They gobbled up the iron. If you do a Prussian blue stain, these are what people, if they cough up sputum, and they're in heart failure, these are called heart failure cells that back up because of the heart in this case, the blood was backing up and the red blood cells are eaten by the uh, macrophages. Then when you look at what's the problem, she has a rare condition. What happened was, and I'll show you some of the causes, the, the pulmonary veins became thicker. So if the veins became thicker, the blood returning back to the left side of the heart, what happens to the size of the lumen? It decreases. So that impeded blood getting through the capillary to the venous system and it backed up for all those months and probably years that she was misdiagnosed. And here's just showing you an elastic stain. We turn the elastic, we tell this is a vein because it has one layer versus two in an artery, and this wall is thicker than normal. Here's a longitudinal section. Here's the wall of a vein on one side. We cut it, and you can see the lumen is much smaller because the wall is thicker. So he, she had a condition called pulmonary venal occlusive disease. And so if you go to the normal circulation, any part in the body where there's a circulation, you have an artery or arterial from an artery that goes in the capillary bed, you see the pink representing oxygenated blood, then it becomes deoxygenated as the gas exchange is taking place, and you go through a venule. Her disease was here, where it became thickened and now it backed up. So what's bad about that when the blood backs up? Here we see a normal blood where we see the oxygenation content and as the gas exchange takes place, the oxygen is taken up by the tissue and you release carbon dioxide and go back to the lungs. When you have inflammation, what color is the inflamed tissue? It is red. Or when you exercise, you notice you get flushing in the face. That's good because you notice the amount of oxygen content is greater, so you're supplying the capillaries and the veins and it's called vasodilatation. Now what happens when you have obstruction? 
On the Venus side, it backs up. What do you notice about the oxygen content in the capillary bed? It goes now, and now you're going to cause chronic epoxic injury. The most common cause of cell injury in our body is the lack of oxygen. We call the term hypoxia. So this is a patient like she would have looked. When you walk into a room or you saw somebody like that, you would say, what? She's probably what? Obese. She's in congestive heart failure on the right side. And the reason she's obese, or what you think is obese, is because it's all fluid. She's basically, all the fluid is backing up and stretching all her tissues. She's not fat at all. The question is, she developed this rare vascular lesion in her, as adulthood, but then the first thing you think of in this country, anywhere in the world, you get bigger, what's the first thing you think of? Right. But that's not how you have to go into it. There are many things that can cause someone to be larger. A tumor, there was a story in China, they found a 33-pound tumor in the abdomen of a woman. She weighed 250 pounds, and they thought she was fat, but it was really a tumor. The largest record on, in, was a woman that weighed, the tumor weighed 325 pounds. What do you think most people thought that tumor was due to? Obesity. So as a clinician, just because you see someone large does not mean they're obese. And that's another issue of being big will delay the diagnosis of diseases that need to be treated. And so the etiology of this is what is called pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. You can see it in AIDS patients. Their cytokines or chemicals are released that cause damage to it. You can see it as immunocomplex, immunologic disease can cause this. There are congenital genetic disease. It may be associated there's something wrong with the metabolism of these cells in the veins. And then there are toxins from certain chemotherapeutic regimens and so forth. The radiation for cancer can precipitate a very rare complication, or it can be multifactorial, many factors coming together that causes damage. It's a disease, unfortunately, is made at the time of autopsy in the majority of cases. So the final diagnosis was pulmonary venoocclusive disease. She had massive ascites, fluid in the abdominal cavity. She developed cirrhosis of the liver because of the chronic hypoxic injury of the liver. And then she also developed acute pneumonia because she had atelectasis because of all that fluid. And she developed sepsis and she also emphysema. So in summary, what are the main take home points about obesity? Obesity is a problem of what? Total energy balance. We must find a balance and each person is different. And so you have to think of your family, what your activity, behavioral response, genetic makeup, all these are very important. Obesity is multifactorial and complex. There's no simple answer. A diet out there that's going to solve it, to take your money and make you these promises. It's, you have to approach it in a multifaceted approach. And the other thing about obesity, the pathology of obesity is devastating and every organ, I just showed you a sample, is affected in obesity. And the last thing is, how do we now tackle the global impact of obesity? Partnering to improve the lives of all that are affected by obesity through education, research, and advocacy. And hopefully tonight, I've done that for you. And it's moderation in life of total energy balance. A balanced diet and exercise. Okay? Thank you very much.